Um, needless to say that Tasbih is a form of dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran mentions Tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different ways. Um, and uh, in different surahs of the Quran, you will read about Sabbah al-Lahi, Yusabbihu bihamdi. In uh, Surah Al-Hashr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sabbah al-Lahi ma fi al-samawat wa ma fi al-ard. وهو العزيز الحكيم الله سبحانه وتعالى في سورة الصف سيس سبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم إن الجمعة يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم سورة التغاب يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير سورة تسبيح الله سبحانه وتعالى في الله سبحانه وتعالى is constantly being uh, repeated in the Holy Quran. And needless to say that we, as we mentioned, the Sbih is a form of ibadah. And the Prophet Sallallahu talks about this specific kind of ibadah which is a thicker, remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we said that remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is of different forms and of different kinds. The scholars, the scholars say that there are at least three forms of Remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is dhikrul uh, al-sina, when you remember Allah by your tongue. And this is a good form of dhikr, it's a reminder. Uh, however, this is not the highest form of dhikr. The advanced form of dhikr is dhikr uh, of the qalb, the heart, and the tongue. So you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you associate what you say with your tongue, a meaning in your heart. So, for example, if you make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the meaning that uh, sparks in your heart is the meaning of love and gratitude to his message, a message sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you make the dhikr of istighfar, uh, the meaning that sparks in your heart is a meaning of sincerity and strong will to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to quit sins altogether. Uh, if you remember Allah and say, La ilaha illallah, then the meaning that sparks in your heart is that of tawheed that the only deity worth worshipping is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the only one that is truly deserving of being feared and revered and loved and trusted uh, and relied on is Allah wa ta'ala so this is, this is the dhikr of both the heart and the tongue now the, the highest form of dhikr is the dhikr of presence or existence is when you live your life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you as a person, you in your totality become a true Muslim because you're always in a state of remembrance. So you're always reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at things, when you see things around you, you're constantly reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're a constant firm form of dhikr. And this was this is how the Salihun and above all the Anbiya, this is how they were remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu talks about dhikr in general as we, we've discussed, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a great emphasis on dhikr in the Qur'an. But the Prophet Sallallahu made remembering of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even highest than jihad, even highest than fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the battlefield, even that important sacrifice of religion, that you put yourself on the front line to protect your family, protect your country, uh, protect the well-being of people around you when faced with danger, even that sacrifice with life, dhikr is actually higher than that. The Prophet Sallallahu uh, asked the Sahaba, أَلَا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِخَيْرِ أَعْمَالِكُمْ وَأَزْكَاهَا عِنْدَ مَلِيكِكُمْ وَأَرْفَعِهَا فِي دَرَجَاتِكُمْ وَخَيْرِ لَكُمْ إِنْ فَاقِ الذَّهَبُ وَالْوَرَقِ وَخَيْرِ لَكُمْ إِنْ تَلْقَ وَعْدُوَكُمْ فَتَضْرِبُوا أَعْنَاقَهُمْ وَيَضْرِبُوا أَعْنَاقَهُمْ قَالُوا بَلَى يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ سبحانه وتعالى. So the Prophet Sallallahu was teaching the Sahaba in the way he always taught them alayhi uh, and he used this specific technique where he asks a, a question to the Sahaba and that sparks their excitement and their curiosity about his question, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he asks them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do I not tell you about uh, a good deed or the best of deeds, that which is most beloved to your Lord, the wa ta'ala, uh, and the, the highest for you uh, in your scale with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I have a small headache. Uh, and then they said, uh, and then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
and even better for you than spending uh, the gold and the silver and in the, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even better for you than meeting your enemy and then getting engaged in fighting with your enemy so that they slit your throats and you slit their throats and the Sahaba walks out and says, yes, Ya Rasulullah, what is that thing? And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Dhikrullah, the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. <clears throat> so, why is that? Because the ultimate reason of why we do ibadah is to be with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This is why we pray and why we fast and taqwa, right? This is why we slaughter and adha. Allah says in the Quran that Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will not benefit from the blood of the sacrifice that you make. But the taqwa of your hearts is what Allah wants from you when you do that sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the form of ibadah that actually break, breaks, breaks those these boundaries and uh, brings you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think of Allah wa ta'ala. Excuse me. And then the Prophet sallallahu says in the hadith, the example of those people who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who don't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the example of someone who's alive and someone who's dead. Uh, the hadith in Arabic, مثل الذي يذكر ربه ولذي لا يذكر ربه مثل الحي والميت Someone who's alive and someone who's not alive. Now, a tasbih is a specific form of dhikr. And why is tasbih important? There are multiple hadiths that the Prophet mentions the tasbih. Uh, in the famous famous hadith, the Prophet uh, that was uh, narrated by uh, registered by Imam Nawawi in his 40 hadith, so you can find that there. It's hadith number 23 for Imam Nawawi, uh, It's a hadith uh, talking about the importance of prayer, the importance of uh, wudu, the importance of fasting, and among those things, uh, the Prophet وسلم, talks about a thick. So uh, the hadith is uh, The purity is half of the faith The wudu is half of the faith Saying Alhamdulillah fills the scales of the hasanat uh, Saying Subhanallah Tasbih And saying Alhamdulillah So saying Subhanallah Fills the scales between the heavens and the earth now, the scholars looked at that, and they looked at what is the meaning of SubhanAllah, and what, is, what does it uh, signify when you have SubhanAllah coupled with Alhamdulillah? What does that mean? So, the scholars have different opinions about that. But basically, a tasbih, the essence of tasbih, is to negate anything deficient away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is tasbih. And where is that coming from? That comes from the root word of the word tasbih, which is sabaha. And sabaha, for those who speak Arabic, we use it in a, in a way to mean that someone was swimming, sabaha, right? But the true essence of the word is not swimming. Sabaha, from the, the word, the root word for sabaha, the meaning of that is to actually be at a distance, be at a long distance. This is why uh, Al-Mutanabbi, in, uh, in his famous poetry, he says, خير مكان في الدنيا سرج سابح وخير جليس في الأنام كتاب. So the best place for someone to be in this world, as people who you know ride horseback know about that, سرج سابح is the horse, the back of a horse that is سابح. سابح means running like speed light. So that's the word سابح. It means just it goes for a long, long distance. It's very distant. وكل في فلك يسبحون. Each one of those, Allah talks about the constellations in the heavens, that all these constellations are in different orbits. Yasbahun. What does that mean? They mean that they're actually distant from each other, but on their own orbit. So this is the word sabah. So when you say yusabbihu, or sabbaha lillah, when you say subhanallah, you actually negate anything deficient from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that you make anything deficient very distant from Him, the Barakah wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu when he was with, with the Quraysh, he was asked by them to actually bring more miracles. And they asked him, well, why don't you ascend to the heavens? Get us some gold. Why don't you like, have rivers here in the desert? Do us all these like, huge, big miracles. And then the Prophet would say, Subhanahu wa rabbi, al kuntu illa basharun, 
Rasula. What does that mean? This tasbih of the Prophet Sallallahu means that, SubhanAllah, what is, are you asking me to be partners with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Are you asking me to decide when the miracle would happen and what the miracle is? This is not my work. This is the work of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So, Subhan is for him, Tabarak Ta'ala. May he be distant from any deficiency to have a partner like me who would decide when the miracle would happen and what the miracle will be. Is that point clear? This is why the Prophet ﷺ said through the Quran, Subhanahu Rabbi. And then when you make tasbih to Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala, tasbih is often coupled with salah as well, right? Uh, in the Quran, Sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la. Some scholars say this is a, this means the salah, Sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la. Because you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your salah, uh, salah al So these are some of the meanings of, of tasbih of Allah wa ta'ala. Now, what, what really is of interest for me today is to talk about a specific meaning of that tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, specifically the tasbih of bewilderment. When we are bewildered with something, when we really find something fascinating, we say subhanAllah. Right? We say subhanAllah al -Azim. And this subhanAllah al wa bihamdi is one of the greatest forms of, of dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And the scholars say that when you make the sabih, as we said, you negate anything deficient from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you say al azim we actually get a certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest. So this is the highest form of confirmation of the meaning. As when you say, you know, uh, Ramzi is not lazy. He is so, you know, so energetic, for example. So you negate a meaning, and then you put a positive meaning on that. So this is the highest form of affirmation, right? So when you say Subhanahu Rabbi Al Azim, you say Subhanahu Rabbi. You negate anything deficient from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and you assert that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the greatest Al Azim. The the, one of the meanings of tasbih, as we said, is the sense of bewilderment, and we often do that. We do that a lot. When we see something really fascinating, we say, oh, subhanAllah, this is beautiful. So look at this flower, subhanAllah, it's beautiful. Look at these mountains, look at these seas, look at these skies, they're so beautiful, subhanAllah. This is a great way of getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there are three stages as well of this sense of approach to the world around us and how we can think about the creation. The first stage is that of bewilderment. This is, it's a relatively a superficial stage, which is a great khayr, it's great. But it's, it's, it's the beginning of starting to know the world so we can know the creator of the body of Ta'ala. When you see something beautiful and you say, SubhanAllah, I was, I was, I was biking today, uh, went to uh, the area of Sagis, Revere, and Lynn. And there was, uh, it's, it's called the Romney Marsh. They have a lot of, you know, a lot of marshes there, it's a small river. Uh, it can be stinky, uh, but I, I managed to bike on its side, and I, I got to jump to the water side as well a little bit. And I, I found this weird creature, creature that I haven't seen before. It, it was the shell of a creature, it was a skeleton, so this, this creature was, uh, was dead. And I looked at it, and it, it looked like a combination of a turtle, uh, or maybe something like a spider, like a scorpion, uh, but also looked like a crab, which I haven't seen before. How it was, it was amazing. I thought it was a toys game for kids or something. But then actually, I saw it. I saw it on the, on the side of the of the river. And this is a marsh. Where the sea goes in that inside that region. So I went home and looked for like what could that be, and I discovered that this is something called the horseshoe crab. It's a kind of a crab called the horseshoe crab. And apparently, this species has been on Earth for the past, depends on what exactly what strain of it, about 300 million years, approximately. <coughs> so this old species, it depends some uh, you know, kinds of it, probably 400 million years. But, but this, this very common kind of it, it's been on you know, roaming the face of Earth for the past 300 million years. So the first form of uh, superficial bewilderment that I had and said, SubhanAllah, this is, this is like a real thing. I thought that was plastic or something, but it was actually a real thing. The second stage after the stage of Roman, which is something that we all have to do, so we can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to actually investigate this is something that is really astonishing. 
that we find bewildering for us. <clears throat> what is this really? What's, what's behind this really? And not just standing from, from a distance and looking at it saying, this is beautiful, and just moving on. In Abu Ghazali actually, in his, uh, in his book, Ahiyya Abu Muddin, he has multiple paragraphs that teach people how to make tafakkur, how to reflect on Allah's creation. So in, in his uh, beautiful book, uh, and specifically about the form of tafakkur, he actually gives a lot of examples. And he talks about human development, talks about the embryo. He talks about how the backbone of our you know, body, are, you know, the, the, the spines are they stacked in order. He talks about how the neck is formed in a, in a way where the head sits comfortably on it. Uh, he talks about the bones of the skull. Uh, talks about uh, how the embryo is created, talks about multiple, how the sperm goes into uh, the womb and meets an ova. So he talks about human development, but there's a beautiful thing that he says about people who don't reflect on Allah's creation. So he says, uh, And the, all the bewilderment and all strangeness is from people who see a beautiful calligraphy on the wall and they really find that very beautiful. And then after seeing that beautiful masterpiece, they start thinking about the artist that made that beautiful calligraphy. And how artful, and how artsy, and how talented are these people? They're looking at the, the delicate intricacies, looking at the delicate detail of that piece of art. And the power that they have to create such a beautiful thing. And then with that rule, when they say, this person says, this must be a great artist. How skillful that artist is. How perfect is his industry. And how skilled are his hands. But then they look at the wonders around us and within ourselves and then don't and they don't pay attention and they're not alerted to the beauty of their creation and the great power of the Creator and they're not perplexed, this is important, and they're not perplexed by their majesty and their wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's making a, a, an analogy about things that we like and that we see and that we reflect about their makers and creators and about contemplating on our creation and the creation of the world around us. What Imam al-Ghazali is saying is that this sense of bewilderment is really important. And if we're not bewildered by the creation, there is something missing from our Imam. This sense of astonishment about the creation is something that we have to make space for in our lives. You know, this, is, this is really important. You know, one, of the, one of the English uh, poets, I think his name is Lord Byron, um, he has a very famous line of poetry. He says, uh, child is the father of the man. Child is the father of the man. He was talking about nature. And the reason he said that is because the children are so much closer to our mother earth. I mean, you see kids playing with the soil, right? They, they love the soil. Kids, they just love it. And they build things with it. And they, they make holes. And they, they, and they play with, you know, with, with wagons. And they, they like building stuff with the soil. The fact that the very fact that playing with it is really important for them. Uh, and we probably all have memories of our childhood and we have children here. You can tell us how much you'd like to play with the soil. Uh, so this is really important. So you know, children are very close to, to earth. They're down to earth, right? And they need that. And that energy that they have is really, really important for them to mingle and go out and maybe hug trees and be with the nature. As we grow older, for some reason we lose that touch with our reality. 
we we miss we miss being with nature and we sometimes forget that we need that as well. And this being in touch with a creation, with a certain manufacturer, throws in your heart the majesty of the manufacturer. So if you work in a, a, a Verizon, for example, and uh, whatever you work, and then uh, I don't want to make an ad for or T-Mobile or whatever, uh, or AT&T, uh, and then there's some like very interesting gig they come up with. You'll say, this is amazing. How did they, how did they manufacture that, right? How are they send, sending shuttles to space? This is crazy. How are they doing that? This is amazing, right? But we've worked so much with matter that we've we've developed this greatness in our heart for the creations of us, and we've forgotten to actually be in touch with Allah's creation, so we can actually reflect on Allah's majesty. This is why you know this college really encouraged that people would have a time of reflection. You go on an excursion and. You try to be with, on your own and reflect on Allah's creation. So I try to do that today. And I, uh, when I came back, uh, I looked at that scorpion thing, uh, which is a crab, a horseshoe crab. And apparently, the reason why this crab survived for about 300 million years is that it has a highly effective immune system. This horseshoe crab uh, has a very delicate immune system that detects bacteria even at the levels of one in a trillion. Some people will say one in 30 trillion. So what that does is that this, this, this beautiful creature is really very immune. And uh, interestingly, people are actually getting the blood. They're, you know, they're getting do donors, volunteers from the, these, uh, this, this crowd. And they're actually developing, uh, using that to develop drugs. So if you make a drug, and you think, oh, this is this is the final product, this is going to be, you know, tested in humans. Now we have to try to test it in humans. What they do is they extract that from the blood, the blood of the horse, the horseshoe crab, and they get from the blood cells this uh, this substance, uh, and they mix it with the product. If a gel forms, if this mix coagulates, then they know it's not clean yet, and it has bacteria in it. So they say, okay, sir, whatever drug company this is, this is not clear, you'll have to purify that, otherwise it'll be not safe for human use. Even more interestingly, this, uh, this, these blood cells that this animal has actually detects endotoxins, not just bacteria. And so bacteria produce toxins our systems, right? <clears throat> bacteria are nasty, they're bad. Uh, one of their nasty thing that, things that they do is they produce toxins in our body, and our bodies react with these toxins, and we can get a septic shock, and people sometimes can die because of that. So what happens is this uh, horseshoe crab, the, the blood cells actually detect not just the bacteria, but in the toxin as well, and mixes with the toxin and coagulates, makes it gel, sort of, and in a sense, immobilizes these toxins. So now they're using that in medication industry to try to make sure that you know these uh, these drugs are actually clean and good for human use. So this this interesting creature, if we got engaged in a superficial level of bewilderment and said, "Also, oh, how long did we move on after that?" Uh, if if the, if the person who met that animal said, "Also, oh, how long? Maybe I don't know what this is. Looks weird," and then they moved on after that, we wouldn't have discovered this great discovery. So with the bewilderment of the creation, we need to dig a little bit deeper to try to see what is the wisdom, as Imam al-Ghazali said. The wisdom and the power. What is the wisdom behind this creation? So this, this, this one of the wisdoms, that this creature survived for 300 years and this is what, what it has. Another great creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I talked about that in the khutbah yesterday, uh, if the tree, very famously called the sequoia tree. Sequoias are probably one of the oldest, you know, probably one of the older trees that we have uh, on Earth. They can live up to 3,000 years. Uh, actually, there are, uh, in, if you go to the, you know, uh, to the California, to the, to the West Coast, there are multiple forests, forests that have sequoia trees. One of the, one of the other, you know, the big uh, 
forest that they have is called the Mariposa Grove, which has a lot of sequoia trees. Um, and the sequoias can, can really, really, really gigantic. I mean, one uh, sequoia tree that they have, you know, uh, the Sequoia National Park, they gave them names. So this is, this specific one is called General Sherman. This is the tree, that's what they call the tree. Uh, it measures in, you know, uh, in circumference uh, about 30 meters. Can you imagine that? 30 meters in circumference. This is, this is huge. Uh, 83 meters tall. Can you, can you imagine that? This is a tree. This is a tree that can be 83 meters, uh, meters tall. Um, so to, to, to give us an, uh, an estimate, you know when people go to the Olympics and they do the 100 meters, you know, the lab? So if you open that lab, the 100 meter lab, and you open it and make it a straight line, it's, that tree is almost as high. This is a huge tree. Okay. The estimated weight of that tree is about uh, 6,000 tons. This is how much this could weigh. In, in, uh, there actually they've, uh, they have this interesting thing where the trucks can actually go under the tree. If you have a small truck, it can actually go under, under the tree. It's huge, it's an enormous creature. So we can sit and, and look at that tree and say, subhanAllah, this is, this is amazing, right? But what is, what is the wisdom behind that creation? So that when we say subhanAllah, our subhanAllah would be an insightful subhanAllah. Is SubhanAllah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? How can we develop this sense of tafakkur? So you can ask yourself, why is this tree living for 2,000, 3,000 years? Some of these trees were born before Jesus Christ was born. Can you imagine that? Before Jesus was born. Uh, it's, it's an enormous thing. What happened to these? How does, how does that work? So this is actually an active area of research. But it also seems that this tree has, you know, is very resistant to infections from, from insects and other uh, things that bother trees. Also, very importantly, the inner uh, wood of that tree is not very dense. So God protected that tree from us as people. Because it seems that the most common reason for dying from this tree is not aging. Humans are the most common reason why these plants die. You know, the lumber industry, uh, when they discovered those huge forests, they started cutting off these trees, but they found out that the, the, the trees were not very dense from that side. So they were not good for like manufacturing things with wood. Uh, so Allah saved the trees from the, from the human wrath. Uh, but even with that, people thought that you know, it's a huge thing, you can still do things with that. But eventually in the 1950s, there were actually laws that prohibited people from cutting those, those trees. So. So that was good. Very interestingly, the bark of that tree is actually very thick, extremely thick. So that fires, if fires try to eat that bark, it can't get through the bark to go to the center of the tree. And even more interestingly, the bark of the tree, you know, there are resins that occur in the bark and the wood of the trees that actually is very flammable. This tree doesn't have a lot of that resin that is flammable. So this is why when fires come to eat it, can't eat that tree as it eats other other trees. So, but it's a, it's an active uh, research. Uh, and uh, sequoia trees, by the way, don't have very deep roots. They have deep roots, but they're not very very deep. And this is why you know um, you see trees falling and people have been you know attacking those trees and getting the wood. Uh, but really, the 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 bulk of this tree you know is not very dense, so it, it can go shoot higher uh, in the sky and it doesn't tip uh, as much. So this, uh, this beautiful creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is another sign of him, Tabarak wa ta'ala. That, you know, how fragile is the human existence? You know, how you, you, you sit in front of that tree and you feel dwarfed as a person, figuratively and metaphorically and, you know, practically, you are dwarfed by that presence. And you say, subhanAllah, how, how feeble and how weak is the person as a human being? Sitting of it in front of a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 2,000 years, 2,000 years old. So Allah in, in His universe has sent and put forth the signs for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to think about those signs and to take lessons from those signs and not to pass by and giving a superficial subhanAllah but a deeper, a deeper sense of tasbih to Him tabarakah wa ta'ala. I'm, I'm over my time, so uh, maybe I'll just wrap up with a couple, a couple of thoughts, inshallah. 
the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi as he was described by his companion, alayhi uh, he was described as da'im al fikr. He, he was constantly thoughtful, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this state of existence is not easy. It's easier to, to play video games and watch TV and movies. Uh, it's easier for other people to think for us. It's difficult to think for yourself and to develop this practice of being a thoughtful person and to get into this contemplative and reflective ibadah, to look at the world around us. It's not very easy. So this is why we, we have to train ourselves and we have to plan that ahead of time. So maybe we should plan maybe once a week to go and go back to nature and think about the world. Maybe it will be nice maybe to go on a summer night that is, you know, has a clear sky to go and look at these stars and think about these, this magnificent creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we have to study. Sometimes we have to study the world around us. Sometimes we might lack the capacity to reflect on the world. And this is extremely important. Because if we don't have the tools, we have to learn the tools. I did not know anything about this horseshoe crab. I didn't know anything about these sequoia trees. I had to actually go online and read about them. And to try to understand why does the sequoia live to a thousand years? How come this creature called the horseshoe crab has been here for 300 million years? Why is that? And I, you know, me and Laura were reading stuff today that we didn't know about them. Long words. We had to think about these long words and try to decide what these long words, you know, meant. But eventually we, we learned something. Uh, and this is an essence of Islam. We need to learn more. And sometimes we have to absorb those, you know, uh, beautiful tools. The last thought, which I think is the conclusion, and this is what I wanted to get to, is that for, for some historical reason, uh, we as Muslims in different communities, we develop this feeling that if you delve scientifically into things, that in a sense takes away from the sense of bewilderment that you have. So if you say SubhanAllah, for example, uh, you would expect that there, there should be some miracle behind that that nobody can understand. And then if you understand that miracle, it will take away from the majesty of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very, a very nuanced meaning, and it's very subconscious. Uh, you, can, you can see that a lot when, for example, there is a natural phenomenon, okay? Look at the rain, look at the wind, for example. Uh, look at the lightning, for example, okay? Uh, when you say SubhanAllah, uh, people want to believe that there is, no, there is no mechanism for these things happening. It's a direct divine intervention. There's, there's some miracle happening that causes these things to happen. And if you delve into those things scientifically, in a sense you're taking away from the religiosity and the divinity of those, those things. Do you relate to what I'm saying? Do people have that feeling sometimes? Okay. So, this, this is really, there is nothing further from reality than, than this subconscious insecurity that sometimes we have. Why is that? Because SubhanAllah operates at the macro level and operates at the micro level as well. The, the reason that we are bewildered with Allah's creation from, the, from a general perspective, from a distance, will get us also even more bewildered when we come and dig closer to look at the details about how these things happen. Um, it, there are a lot of examples that we can we can give uh, can give about that, but a lot of people uh, talk uh, about uh, the human body, for example, talk about how the embryo is formed um, and how the gender gets selected of the embryo, uh, and people feel that this is a sacred realm that you know nobody should know, right? And this is historical. And pe people, if you read like books of history and religious debate. You'll see a scholar saying, if, can, you, can, you, can you say what's in the womb of that woman? Can you know if it's a male or female? Right? Can you know? And then people say, no, I don't know. See, you see, this is why you're weak as a human being. This is what lies the graves. Now, if you ask someone today, they'll say, I can know. I'm going to ultrasound. I can know. What's, what's the, you know. Pe people feel that science, in a sense, is opposing religion. Well, this is not the fact, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges that He has the inherent power of the Ta'ala uh, without tools to know what's in the rooms of women, the Baraka Ta'ala. And Allah عنده علم الساعة, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows when the hour is. يعلم uh, مطرضو الحب ما تزداد. Allah subhanahu knows what's in the rooms, whether it's uh, one fetus or more than one fetus, Allah knows that, the Baraka Ta'ala. 
but he has the inherent power without tools to live up to Barak wa Ta'ala. So there, there is some subconscious uh, or unconscious insecurity that we sometimes have that, oh, that if we delve into things scientifically, that kind of devoid, that kind of opposes uh, our sense of bewilderment with Allah's creation. This is, this is furthest from the truth. Um, I, I just want to wrap up with that idea, and this is important for us because as Muslims, we're asked to reflect on the world and understand the world really well. This way, we can use our sense of belonging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our sense of tafakkur uh, with His wisdom, to actually benefit other people, not just as intellectual support. So someone looked at this horseshoe crab and said, I have to find out why this creature has been living here for a long time, and they dissected that animal, looked into the blood and discovered what happened. Like many Muslim scientists did with a lot of other things in our lives, in our Islamic history and civilization. So we need to bring that back, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us from our knowledge, inshaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us back to the tasbih that He wants. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our tasbih and our dhikr to Him. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe we'll take some thoughts and questions that we can have. We'll have to go. Yeah. Yeah. Is someone in the back here? It's funny how the car manufacturers take the brand name of the different vehicles. Toyota has a big SUV called Sequoia. Is that right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it won't last 2,000 years now. <laughs> right? I, mean, like, huh? I used to say Toyota. <laughs> سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر.